what we'll do is um, shift gears only slightly because I'm going to be talking a lot about therapeutics as well, and then um, we'll move on to um, Christopher, who I think will um, provide some of the most interesting data that we'll hear about. So um, I didn't know what to talk about, uh, and so that's part of the problem of being an, someone who's fairly unfocused is you have um, many choices. And I decided to talk more about metabolic complications with sort of the caveat of, like, how much do we really need to hear about this anymore? And that's sort of a theme of what I'll be going over, hopefully, in 19 minutes. So for me, you know, um, I have to always be very mindful of um, what's relevant in our field, because when I first started out um, as a fellow, and the young fellows here will understand this, I was pointed to become like a CMVologist, like, you know, and take care of people with CMV retinitis, and that would be a flourishing career for decades to come. Um, and so I'm always cautious about keeping my eye uh, ahead of the curve. And for me, you know, getting, shifting from that into metabolic complications of our therapies, I had to deal with sort of this evolution. That, you know, first we were dealing with, you know, we're poisoning mitochondria and, and people are getting all sorts of horrible things occurring from our medications. And then we started talking about body fat redistribution, osteopenia, osteoporosis, as we, you know, got into the Tenofovir age and we're seeing people live longer and older with HIV. And again, more recently, this sort of axis of immune activation, inflammation, and then end organ disease like cardiovascular disease. And, and really, this has sort of been the trajectory also of, of my um, work within the metabolics realm. But I think that squarely, we're, we've moved into even another sort of phase, and, and that's this phase. This is this aging obesity phase um, <laughs> that, that sort of, you know, builds upon every other step before this um, to get this, you know, you know, from the mitochondrial toxicity all the way now to um, this highly evolved uh, guy over here. So I, I'm going to break this up into two sort of ways of thinking about this that sort of help me. Uh, the practical stuff, and it, and it really dovetails nicely with what Joe just talked about. This is the nitty-gritty, roll up your sleeves, what do I do in clinic, and how do I make decisions based upon some of the recent data. And then I'm going to talk about stuff that's a little bit more um, highfalutin or a little bit more conceptual um, and involves things that are almost impossible for us to change, like dying um, and getting older and, um, and some of the inevitable consequences that are associated with living on this planet. So the practical, so as a perfect segue, Joe kind of set this up. There's been a number of different clinical trials that have compared therapies and looked at different strategies, and, and I think Joe has taught me certainly to look at this as a strategic type of way of treating HIV. We don't just compare a regimen to a regimen, let's compare strategies, approaches to dealing with disease, and I think that serves us well. And so in this study, I think it's really impressive that we're talking about taking people who are on successful HIV therapy and messing with them. Uh, messing with these people who are doing perfectly fine, um, and to do so with some, some ideas that we're going to make their lives better. And in this case, by switching them to a simpler one pill, once a day regimen that we know works pretty darn well. And he showed you the outcomes data. I'm not going to go over it. It worked well virologically, but there was many reasons why we switch people. And, and one reason could be to get to a simpler pill with one less copay, but there could also be effects as far as uh, tolerability and toxicity. Uh, and we saw that here. So what you see is with switching from a boosted protease inhibitor in people who are doing very well, obviously adhering to their medications, this is not so you know, unexpected, but it's nice to quantify it. You see pretty impressive changes in their lipid profiles. And again, if we believe that you know, bad lipids in people without HIV makes sense to you know, be a, a precursor to cardiovascular disease, it certainly makes sense for people with HIV. So I don't think that that's a big jump. But you see really pretty nice declines in almost all the subsets that you're looking at as far as lipids. And, and when you look at the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL, which again, in non-HIV populations, has been correlated to cardiovascular disease, you do see, do see benefits um, compared to staying on therapy. So if you, you can have your cake and eat it too, which is probably a really bad um, metaphor. Uh, you, can, you can really get on simpler therapy, keep your viral load down, keep that immune activation like the genie in the bottle, and, and have a better lipid profile. Treat enough people, this could be meaningful. In addition, there were, there were differences in symptoms. Again, these are people who there may be biases because maybe they want to switch or maybe they were cajoled into switching. You don't know exactly what's in the mind of these people, but people were willing to switch their therapy, so it may be stacked a little bit. But there was less diarrhea after we switched to the rilpivirine-based regimen, less belly pain and bloating. Again, symptoms that didn't stop these people from taking their original regimen, but you can bet that their quality of life may have, may have improved with the switch. 
We did a very different sort of switch study, and there's many people in this room who've contributed to many of the slides here and the data here, um, and we had a wonderful team of people who work here, and Susan Blevins like almost single-handedly um, opened and closed the study. But this is a study that, that I led that was uh, conducted nationwide, where again, we took people who were doing really well on an atazanavir-based regimen, atazanavir ritonavir with tenofovir FTC. They could have been on some therapy beforehand as long as they didn't uh, switch for virologic failure, but most people were just on their first regimen. And we switched them um, in a two-to-one randomization to a bacavir 3DC and atazanavir without ritonavir. Um, so you, know, you can't give unboosted atazanavir with tenofovir because there's an interaction wherein the tenofovir lowers the atazanavir level, so you need to boost that atazanavir with ritonavir. So unboosted atazanavir, though, can be taken with a back of your 3TC, and that's compared to just maintaining on your therapy. And we presented these data not long ago, and the good news is that there was no impact on virologic suppression. Both arms maintained almost identical. Uh, this is a different way to show it. It's easier with shaky hands to draw a box um, rather than drawing lines superimposed on top of each other. But this clearly showed that there was no uh, ill effects of switching to this regimen, and that makes a lot of sense. That wasn't unexpected. But when we looked at things like inflammatory markers, um, there really was nothing there that, was, that jumped out at us. So CRP, IL-6, D-dimer. We didn't see any of these jump up with the switch from the original regimen to an abacavir based regimen. And again, this is pretty reassuring. I did see this little, little sort of increase that was non significant in CRP um, in the abacavir arm after changing therapy. It kind of mirrors some of what we've seen before. It's a pretty large study, it wasn't significant, but there may be some little bump. We'll see what happens at week 48. This is week 24 data. Also, when you look at renal function, it was sort of the opposite. You see really just some dramatic improvements in markers of uh, tubular function, which again, wasn't too unexpected. So there could be some benefits for some people from switching in that regard. Bone markers also improved, and it doesn't matter which way you looked at it, osteoclastic activity, osteoblastic activity, remodeling. Um, things got better, and that's probably from the switch from Tenofovir. Clinically, how meaningful that is is not clear, but again, these markers show that there may be some potential benefits, and there weren't any apparent harms of switching. The other thing we saw was that when you look at laboratory toxicities, these are emergent or worsenings. This is not like you came in with hyperbilirubinemia and we're counting you. We're talking about emergent, stuff that happened on study over a short period of time of six months. You can see the total bilirubin, an increase to grade two or four, was pretty different between the two arms. And then when you even look at grade three to four, so grade three hyperbilirubinemia is 2.5 times upper limit of normal or greater. Um, so you're starting to see some pretty big differences there too. How meaningful is that, you know, besides the churning yellow, which sometimes happens with people with high bilirubin, um, is not clear. We don't necessarily think that this has bad effects physiologically, although I'll show you the next slide, there's a potential. Um, but this is something, again, that we're seeing, and, and maybe by lessening the therapy, um, you know, in the number of pills and in the amount of ritonavir we're taking to zero, um, maybe we're providing some benefits. This requires a little bit more study, but it opens up this idea of simplification to reduce, uh, you know, pill burden, but also toxicity that I, I think is very impressive and, and tantalizing. Now, what about the hyperbilirubinemia? One thing I just want to call your attention to, there's been some reports lately of atazanavir causing gallstones. We know it can cause kidney stones. Um, I think some of us in the clinic have seen this. I've certainly seen it, and we analyze the stone just like this, and we find that on mass spec, there's a lot of atazanavir there. This is 14 cases. It was in France. 11 of the cases, they actually were able to retrieve the stones. Um, and analyzed um, all of them, and eight of those stones had atazanavir, like, chock full, um, and that's presented here. So, again, just something that we're seeing, uh, whether or not the atazanavir um, is precipitating this in some way, it seems like it is. In the cases that weren't atazanavir stones, does that mean atazanavir didn't have a role? Could there be something it's doing um, to bile excretion that lets there be more concentration of the elements of gallstones? Not clear. Just something to look out for, I think, in people who are on atazanavir who might have some um, colic in the right upper quadrant. Joe, again, showed some really um, impressive recent studies. This is, again, looking at cobicistat versus ritonavir and people getting atazanavir and, and tenofovir FTC. So everything's the same except for here we're using cobi to boost um, the atazanavir. Here we're using the good old ritonavir. So it's a nice head-to-head -head just to see plainly what are the effects of each one on some of these profiles. Meta, um, as far as virologic suppression, we talked about that. It looked great. 
But there were some differences, again, in lipids. So it's, it, you know, we, we often were painting kobe cystad as being just like vertanavir when we saw some of the initial data. But there may be some subtle differences and maybe not, some not so subtle differences as far as what the drug does compared to vertanavir. And so overall, we are seeing it. This is milligrams per deciliter. You know, 10 milligrams per deciliter in your LDL is not, is not a small amount. Uh, and I think that that's pretty impressive. So again, something just to think about. They're, they're not exactly cut from the exact same cloth. Again, adverse events, though, very similar in many ways as far as the GI toxicity. So we don't lose any of that here, and we do see diarrhea, we do see nausea, uh, same sort of thing we saw with vertanavir. Uh, just briefly, raltegravir, we talk about that in efavirenz. I really show this mostly just to show the efavirenz data. For many years, I would really encounter people who would say, well, I don't think efavirenz has any effect on lipids. Efavirenz does have effects on lipids. It just was drowned out compared to what we saw with ritonavir-boosted PIs, or specifically lopinavir ritonavir. But efavirenz does lead to increases in total cholesterol and triglycerides particularly. And, and with raltegravir, we really just don't see that much of that. That, that stays pretty muted as you follow people long term. Um, so just something I, I really just point out so people understand that efavirenz isn't inert when it comes to lipid changes. Um, we did a study here looking at body shape and lipids and bone uh, strength, and this is really another one, another one of these collaborative efforts. Almost every single coordinator in the ACTU helped with the study, and our partners in Durham, because um, several of the patients came from the Durham EI clinic, and that was exciting for us too. Um, and, and really just trying to understand what are body shape changes occurring um, when you start something like raltegravir that doesn't have really any effects on lipids, plus to know if you're an FDC. So a very common regimen, a very potent regimen, a preferred regimen. Everyone was African American. We did that intentionally to see what are the effects in people who are most likely to take the drugs today. Um, and it was really kind of interesting. This is a, a, not a controlled study. It's a single arm study, really exploratory. But what we saw is that every, everyone got fatter in every sort of way you can measure fat. So, you know, limb fat went up, trunk fat went up, deep down belly fat. We did CT scans. We did DEXA scans. Uh, it was pretty impressive. Um, so this idea that people, you know, get skinny arms and legs and they get big bellies, it was really, you just get big everything. Uh, and, and that was pretty much across the board. Uh, we did see a little bit decrease in bone mineral density. It was statistically significant, but I don't think it was really that clinically meaningful, but not unexpected either. Um, but no changes really in most of the other things we care about um, from baseline, such as triglycerides or insulin resistance or non-HDL cholesterol. So it really was helping us just to see what happens on a very common regimen like this um, to body fat in people who are getting therapy. And I think it's pretty consistent with what we've seen in other populations with other drugs. So let's, let's go to the, the, so that's the practical. That's the stuff you can use, you know, in clinic thinking about, well, I've got a patient, he has high lipids. Um, should I switch him? He's on his first regimen. Maybe he's on a boosted PI. Could I switch him to something simpler? What are the data? This kind of helps you. So the nearly impossible. Um, so the part of the problem that I'm dealing with is that um, we're trying to look for uh, comorbidities and we're trying to look for um, problems that are existing in our population that also exist pretty endemically in people in general as they get older. Uh, and that's become really difficult. And when you look at HIV positive folks, comparing them to HIV negative folks, there's a whole bunch of biases because HIV positive people are not randomly selected from the population to get HIV, right? They're selected based upon a whole bunch of factors that have to do with, you know, from the biggest outside of the onion skin, you know, societal structural factors down to individual behaviors and, and childhood factors. So there's a lot that goes on in between. So they're not necessarily representative at all of the general population. So just smoking, for instance, more of our patients smoke than in the general population. Well, how do you correct for that? Very difficult to do. And there's other lifestyle differences. So you have to be really careful when you're comparing HIV positive to HIV negative, even with all the matching and things that you do. So people have tried, and this is one example that I like a lot. This is the ALIVE cohort, and I like it because this is a really, you know, this is a tough population. It's Baltimore, it's inner city, it's, it's current and former IDUs, positive and negative. Odd is going to get a lot at this in the women that are being enrolled in WISE. There's a lot of data there that looks at the same sort of things that I could have shown. But they do find that when you try to correct for as many things as you can or just compare positives and negatives in all sorts of different ways, that HIV-positive people are more likely to have some of these comorbidities. It's not because necessarily the HIV, not because their therapy, maybe it's because of hard living. But when you take people who have a history of hard living, you still see more people with HIV having these comorbidities. Counting for age and HIV-associated disease, you see more liver disease, more anemia, more kidney dysfunction, and obesity. 
not some of these other things. And here's just some of the, the variables that they looked at. And many of these were underdiagnosed, like the alive cohort research assistants diagnosed this. It wasn't found clinically because a lot of these people maybe weren't in clinical care in an aggressive sort of way. So we do see the signal where more people have this. Again, but what's causing it, that's not very clear. Obesity, though, seems to be coming out pretty strongly, and WISE has the same sort of finding as well, where you do see people with HIV having more of a problem, of course, with obesity than wasting syndrome. And these are data from the U.S. military, so you know that they screen people for HIV, so they, they're able to pick up a lot of people with HIV who are recruited to the military and also from the dependents. And just the proportion of people who are overweight and obese is, is stark, and, and it's increasing over time. There's also, uh, there's a lot of bad things we could talk about with obesity and what it does to people, but even some of the things we're really caring about and that are pretty sexy within the HIV realm, like frailty, uh, ob central obesity, having a big belly, having a big waist circumference is associated with things like frailty, and these are data from the VA. We also know that path, uh, physiologically, um, having a big belly, having a lot of visceral fat can lead to a whole bunch of different bad things metabolically, including leading ultimately to inflammation and cardiovascular disease. That's something we're really spending a lot of time concentrating on, uh, but I'm not, not sure we even understand you know, where this comes from. There are some more data, and this is representative of, of sort of obesity and inflammation. So this is from the Sun cohort, and you can see where the sites are. Suspiciously, there's no sites here in the south, so maybe this is a, a little bit of a skewed population. But nonetheless, you know, when you look at how many people are overweight or obese, it's pretty dramatic. Again, uh, a lot of people here, 750 people, all HIV positive, pretty middle-of-the-road CD4 cell counts. Most of them are on therapy. Most of them are doing well on therapy. Um, but still, a lot of people who, by BMI categories, would not be considered at a normal weight at all. And this is probably very representative of what we see in the population, if not a little bit more. And they followed these people for two years, and you can see about 16% you know, had a change in their BMI category. 10% was for the worse. So 10% of people went into a higher um, BMI risk category. And when they looked at inflammatory markers, again, not surprisingly, pretty much every inflammatory marker that they looked at was correlated with obesity. Uh, so I think there's these downstream effects of obesity that we know about, you know, clearly in the non-HIV infected population that are also there in infected people. Add on some of the smoking, add on some of the hard living, whatever, and then you get a prescription for some of the end organ disease that we're seeing. Um, there's other things with obesity I'm not going to get into. That could be the whole talk, but there's some evidence that you see less uh, robust immune responses in people who are obese, some neurocognitive decline associated with central obesity in the charter cohort. Um, and then there was this really interesting study that, that um, I should probably send to Christopher Hurdle, you probably read it, showing that when you did this online uh, survey of people um, about um, hooking up online, these are men who have sex with men, um, placing personal ads in, uh, in, um, webs on websites, increased BMI was associated with less partner rejection. So when they surveyed these guys who were seeking partners on the web and asked them to describe themselves, including their weight and height, um, they found that people who are bigger tended to have less tendency to reject partners that they met on the web and also had um, less safer sex um, behaviors when they followed up with these people. Um, so there may be even some behavioral uh, um, things going on here. So, so what do you do about this? This is a, a huge problem, um, and, and um, there's many people whose lives are, are their centers built around how to deal with obesity outside of HIV, and, and how can we learn from it? Again, this is something that many, like Prima, are very interested in, and we're trying to collaborate with others. It, you know, there's the, the, the easy stuff. You know, we could talk about the plate method and try to instruct people on how to eat better. That, that's part of it, and that, that's low-hanging fruit. I, I'm full of puns today. Um, unintentional. But I think that this is a start, and I, I think we can't ignore this in our clinic, and more and more, we don't have a nutritionist in our clinic, uh, but some clinics do. These are kind of things that we have to start thinking about. There are some data that people can change some of these things through behavior change. And, and you know, we, we build buildings, we erect buildings to try to change people's behaviors. This is another way I think we have to work on it, especially for our motivated patients who aren't doing crack cocaine, who come to their appointments and they want to live. Um, last study I'm going to go over, because I think I'm over time, is, is really, this is very tantalizing. This gets at sort of where we're, we're thinking about, what we have to head towards. This is a really interesting study. It's very small numbers, um, but was published in JAMA and, and really made a stir when it was presented at Croy earlier this year. This is a cross-sectional study looking at um, 
fluorodeoxyglucose um, PET scanning. So the fluorodeoxyglucose is a marker for metabolism. We're used to these types of tests. And, and the idea here is that it's taken up particularly by activated macrophages. And if you give this, infuse this into people and you scan a particular part of the body with PET, you can see where these metabolically active cells are. And, and this time, the PET scan was pointed towards the aorta of people. And there's three groups of people. There's 27 HIV-positive persons who are basically on HIV therapy and doing well, no known cardiovascular disease, 27 HIV-negative individuals also without known cardiovascular disease that are matched on, on a, a number of different variables with the HIV-positive, and then 27 HIV-negative controls who we know have CAD. These guys have atherosclerotic disease, they've had MIs, and they're matched the HIV positive group by gender, but not by anything else. And again, we're scanning them with this pretty cool thing. So the HIV positive patients, you can hear, you can read here, have a high CD4 cell count, most are undetectable. Uh, the ages are different, I'm gonna skip that. Here's what this kind of thing looks like. So they scan the person, they take these views, they do some funky calculations, and they come up with a score, and they get to publish it in JAMA. Um, so, so this is what the pictures look like. So this is the participant with HIV. And all this stuff here, that's bad. That's activation. That, that's purportedly showing these macrophages that are highly active in the wall of your aorta. Uh, that cannot be good. And when you look at the non-HIV match controls, you see much less of this. In fact, when you look at these folks, compared to the people with atherosclerotic disease, there's no difference. So here's the HIV positive, and here's the HIV negative who have known CAD. Even though these folks are on average 10 years older than these guys, the amount of uptake that they saw, the amount of activity, um, was about the same, but was in, much higher than what you saw with the HIV negative people who didn't have aortic sclerosis or known cardiovascular disease. It's a small study. It's supposed to be provocative. It's supposed to help us understand you know, what's going on here, how much of this is immune activation that continues despite there being good HIV therapy on board, uh, really, I think, uh, opens up some ideas for ways we have to move forward. Okay. There was, lastly, a study that looked at aspirin. It's a very, very simple study. It's provocative. Again, they gave aspirin, baby dose aspirin, 81 milligrams, to a few people with HIV and a few people who are HIV negative. Um, they gave them only a week, and they measured a whole bunch of different things, including platelet aggregation, platelet function. And what they saw was that there was differences between the two arms. There was also differences in T cell activation, um, and that this persisted even a week after they stopped the aspirin. So there was some persistent activity. So again, there's things that people are working on. There's a very exciting things coming through the ACTG, looking at reducing immune activation, looking at remodeling of the immune system to try to prevent some of these brewing, you know, low hum of activation and inflammation that may lead to some increase in badness for our patients. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to switch it over and introduce Christopher Hurt, who's going to bring it on home um, and really talk to stuff that I think about stuff that a lot of us care a lot about. <laughs>